quick summary of the past semester. Uh, we've been talking about the basic question of why I think that Christianity is true. That's sort of the, the broad question. Now, you can kind of think of the argument like this. You could consider somebody who objects to Christian belief or even, or even just belief in God in general um, by simply saying something kind of like this. It's wrong to believe anything without evidence. And since there's no evidence for God or for Christianity in particular, then it's wrong to believe in God or believe in Christianity. Now, there are actually two components of that. The first one is a pretty radical claim that says that all beliefs must be based on evidence. Um, there are certainly some beliefs that are based on evidence, but all of them seems a bit much. Now, this semester, for the past several weeks, we've been addressing the second part of that, which is the claim there is no evidence for God and there is no evidence for Christianity. So the question is, if someone says, what evidence or arguments are there for Christianity? There are a variety of different ways you can approach that question. We've been going through the route called classical apologetics, which starts by answering the question that God exists. So we started at the beginning of the semester by surveying three of the most popular arguments, um, the cosmological, teleological, and axiological arguments uh, for the existence of God. And the conclusion of these arguments are basically that God's the best explanation for why anything exists, God is the best explanation for why the universe appears to be uh, fine-tuned for life, and God is the best explanation um, for the appearance of uh, objective uh, morality. So if they're successful, it gets you to a sort of generic belief in God. Now, the second part of uh, the classical apologetics approach is to respond to arguments against the existence of God. Um, and we focus primarily on the problem of evil. So the problem of evil comes in two flavors. The strong version, which says it's logically impossible for God to exist if evil exists. And that's such a strong claim, it's really easy to, to show that it doesn't follow. Uh, the uh, second version is the, is the weaker version, but it's actually, ironically, a little bit stronger because it's harder to, to argue against. And that is that um, if uh, God exists, then evil is surprising. In other words, evil is evidence against the existence of God. It's not impossible, but it's very surprising. And we talked about three basic responses to that. The first one is you could just say, okay, yeah, it's evidence against God, but it's not stronger than the three lines of argument that we just started with. So that's the most like conceding everything. A slightly more um, aggressive response is what's called the skeptical theist response, which says actually evil is a, the, uh, it, it's a type of data point that's so difficult to understand, it's not really evidence for anything. In other words, in order for it to be evidence against the existence of God, you would have to demonstrate that there is gratuitous evil. In other words, every single instance of evil uh, has no overarching purpose, um, and it doesn't, it's not outweighed by some greater good. And whether or not that's true, it's almost impossible to show that that's true. So the skeptical theist says evil really can't be evaluated evidentially just because of how big of a proposition it is. And the most aggressive response is actually to say, no, you're wrong that evil is not evidence against God because we know why God allows evil. Maybe it's for free will, maybe it's for soul building, something like that. And that third uh, response is what's called theodicy. Now, you can see that there's a spectrum of responses. The very conciliatory, I will grant you your argument, but your argument's not very strong, all the way to, I will refute your argument. Um, so there's a wider response to, to that. So the question is, suppose, and we're actually going to suppose, that this first step and this second step have been successful. Suppose that we have these positive arguments for the existence of God, and suppose we have reasonable responses uh, to arguments against the existence of God. Where does that actually get you? Um, and it gets you to, there is some type of a God that exists. That's not really all that helpful if you want to talk about Christianity in particular. Now, um, this is important because for the rest of today's discussion, what you think about God is going to influence how you evaluate some of the evidence. So I'll go ahead and state one of the key assumptions up here at the beginning, which is I'm going to assume, just for the sake of argument, that these first two steps are successful and that uh, not to the point where God has been demonstrated beyond a reasonable doubt, but let's just say that instead of thinking that the probability that God exists is like, say, 20%, let's say it's like mm, in the 50 or 60% range. Now, I personally, I don't think that's true. I think these arguments are a lot stronger than that. 
But let's just grant for the sake of argument that we've gone from a God probably doesn't exist to a, I, I suppose that uh, there could be a God. The last step is how does that get you anywhere close to Christianity? And that's what we're going to talk about today. First of all, let me just say that any argument for Christianity is, of course, going to have to go through Jesus being the founder uh, and perfecter of the Christian faith. If we can establish something historically relevant about him, we'll be the foundation for making an argument that Christianity is true. So in particular, the argument would be Jesus's prime miracle, which would be that Jesus rose from the dead. Because the resurrection of Jesus literally is like the very center of the Christian faith. If it's false, Christianity completely falls apart. If it's true, it's a very strong foundation for uh, believing additional propositions related to uh, Christianity. So there are two a priori objections to the resurrection. The first is uh, you can't demonstrate the resurrection happened because it's a miracle. So two weeks ago, Dr. Micah Green talked about that and said, actually, no, there are reasonable ways that you can address whether or not miracles have happened in, in history. The historian is not uh, restricted from investigating a miracle. Okay, well, fine. Suppose that miracles are possible and they can be investigated. As it turns out, Jesus didn't exist. So the question of did Jesus exist is one of those things that I mentioned last week that's honestly not a, a highly debated question outside of like sort of popular level religious debate. Once you get outside of the pews and once you get outside of like internet forums and uh, atheist internet forums, like no one really debates whether or not Jesus existed. But the important part is why do the majority of historians think that Jesus existed? And by majority, that's underselling it. Why is there like an academic consensus that uh, Jesus existed? And it essentially comes down to this statement, that Jesus is abundantly attested in early sources. Um, but that mere fact doesn't tell you everything. Just because someone pops up in a historical source doesn't necessarily mean that that source is relevant to all the historical questions related to that person. So what we discussed last week were uh, three particular questions that we want to probe whenever we're discussing Jesus in history. You could arguably say this is for everyone in history, but it's especially true for Jesus. So the first one is just who was Jesus? And that is a question that can be, uh, I mean, there have been many, many, many volumes that have been written trying to answer this question. You know, what did Jesus teach? What did he do uh, both in history? How did he perceive himself? What was he about as a person? It's an enormously difficult question um, and has been the center point of historical Jesus studies. <clears throat> now, the second question is, what was the fate of Jesus? That is, what actually happened to him? Um, and the main thing would be, of course, he was crucified, and then maybe something happened to him after that. And then the third one, uh, the third question is, what was early Christianity all about? What were the beliefs, practices, activities of the people that continued to follow Jesus even after he died? So um, just to give an example, when we talk about, there was a letter that we talked about uh, from Pliny the Younger that was written in 112 AD. In this letter, uh, Pliny mentions something about early Christians uh, worshiping the Lord early on Sunday morning. And he mentions Jesus by name. That of course tells you a lot about question number three, but it tells you almost nothing about question one or question two. Likewise, we talked about uh, some of the uh, sources that stand behind the Gospels. So, for example, there's a hypothetical source that contains a list of all the sayings of Jesus. That doesn't tell you anything about what happened to him or what the practices of his early followers uh, were. But if you have a statement of this is this particular teacher's greatest hits and this is some of his best quotes, that tells you a lot about what he stood for. So today what we're going to focus on, and here's actually a summary of that, by the way. These are all the sources that we talked about. Um, and then here are the hypothetical sources that we talked about last, uh, last week. So, uh, but today we're going to focus in on that question of what actually happened to Jesus after he died. And we're going to talk about some historical arguments uh, for the resurrection. Now, um, in order to do that, I think it's important to discuss two very important pieces uh, or two very important sources just as a refresher before we go into this topic. So the first one is this uh, creed that's listed in 1 Corinthians 15. This is written by Paul. Uh, it's not disputed or anything like that. And Paul says here that he delivered to the Corinthians as a first importance what he also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brethren all at one time, then he appeared to James, 
Then he appeared to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. And the me, of course, being Paul. What's important is that this is the creed that is probably the earliest piece of Christian literature uh, in the New Testament. It is uh, dated. People debate about how early it goes back to. Most people say it's about five years after Jesus died, which is way earlier than even the earliest of Paul's letters, uh, which is 1 Thessalonians, which was probably written about 15 years uh, after Jesus. So that's an important uh, data point we'll be coming back to a lot. Now, whenever you look at all these sources, you start to see an outline of sort of what the Christian claim is. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, which we just read, if you read the speeches and acts, the speeches and acts preserve what the apostles were initially preaching uh, to the Jews as well as to the uh, other people in Judea, what they were claiming immediately after Jesus died. And then, in, for example, in Mark and uh, Matthew and Luke, you, of course, have a narrative account of what happened to Jesus. And it's the same sort of four-line uh, issue or a four-line uh, structure. Christ died, he was buried, he was raised, he appeared. Acts uh, chapter 13, uh, though they could charge him with nothing, uh, they asked Pilate to kill him. They took him down from the tree, they laid him in a tomb, God raised him from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who came up uh, with him from Galilee. And then, of course, Mark uh, would uh, communicate uh, the crucifixion of Jesus, the burial of Jesus. Um, and it alludes to the resurrection, but it doesn't actually uh, mention it directly. So now, the, with that quick review, we're going to turn to this actual question of did Jesus rise from the dead? Now, this is a absolutely massive topic that we could spend an entire semester on. I have here just a small sampling of books to give you an idea of just how long, uh, and, and, and like how much literature is out there. And this is just a super small sample. So I'm going to very intentionally truncate uh, a lot of the discussion to just a few of the most relevant points so that we um, can have a productive conversation, not spend an enormous amount of time in the weeds. So here are the primary sources here. Uh, these are probably like, uh, these three up here are the big three. When you talk about what are the most contemporary, like uh, sort of conservative evangelical treatments of the historicity of the resurrection, uh, it's William Lane Craig's Assessing the New Testament Evidence for the Historicity of the Resurrection of Jesus, Mike Lacona's Resurrection of Jesus, which is this right here, this massive book, and uh, N.T. Wright's uh, Resurrection of uh, the Son of God. Uh, each of these books is like over 600 pages long, um, and it's enormous. Um, and they all take a little bit different approach uh, to the question. I would highly recommend the center one, The Resurrection of Jesus by Lacona. I, I agree with all but like three words in the book. Like, it's very good. There are only three words I disagree with. Um, and then I'm going to supplement that. There's a chapter written in the Blackwell Companion by uh, Tim and Lydia McGrew, which I think is pretty helpful, um, that we'll refer to a little bit. Okay? So those are your, your sources there. Okay, so last week we talked about some of the fate of Jesus. And here, these are kind of the four big facts that get thrown around about him. Uh, some people talk about minimal facts. I'm not going to get into all of that. Uh, but these are basically the four things that you got to talk about when you say what happened to Jesus, ultimately. First, completely uncontroversially, literally no one debates this, Jesus was crucified under the reign of Pontius Pilate. No debate there. In fact, that's probably the last time we're going to talk about that fact, because there's no controversy in it. The second one has um, orders of magnitude more controversy, which is Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea buried Jesus in a tomb, and the tomb was later found by a group of Jesus' uh, women followers on the first day of the week following the crucifixion. That, on the other hand, is probably the most controversial fact about Jesus. The third one is various individuals, groups, uh, after uh, the discovery of the empty tomb, experienced on very different occasions and uh, circumstances appearances that they interpreted to be Jesus uh, living after his crucifixion. And then lastly, the, uh, the disciples came sincerely to believe in Jesus' resurrection without any influences from uh, Judaism or from other pagan religions. You can also add on this that there were uh, some skeptics like uh, Paul that converted as well, which uh, Paul's conversion is also highly important. Okay. Now, something that's relevant here when you talk about an argument for the resurrection, these first two, well, first one and a half facts, these are more background facts than they are relevant to uh, the actual resurrection claim. If you have a story about a guy who's crucified and buried, there's nothing demanding like a resurrection or anything like that. Uh, 
but the others are much more evidential in their force. Um, so I make a distinction there be, uh, between those two. So the real question is, how do we get to the claim of the resurrection? And it goes through these uh, three lines. First, of course, you have a tomb that's empty. Uh, third, or sorry, second, you have appearances of Jesus after his death. And then thirdly, you have the origin of uh, Christian belief. Um, and together, the best explanation of all these sort of various phenomenon is that Jesus actually did rise from the dead. Now, I talk a lot about the sort of um, minutia that you can get into on these arguments. Let me just give you an example here. These are five sub-arguments that you can give for the empty tomb. Uh, I started to add the rest of them, uh, the sub-sub-arguments, but um, I, I mean literally like there are probably three for each one of those. So what I've decided to do for this time around that we're going to treat this topic is we're not going to talk about every single sub-argument and sub-sub-argument and sub-sub-sub-sub-argument for uh, these facts. Rather, I want to look at some of the sort of weight-bearing ones, the ones that are really controversial and, if they're true, uh, carry the argument a lot more than the other ones. And that would be, first, uh, the testimony of the women to the empty tomb. Whenever scholars say that they accept the empty tomb or that they think it's probably historical, the most persuasive sub-argument for the empty tomb has been women found it. Secondly, when it comes to appearances, what we have here are the disciples' testimony directly. We saw the risen Lord. So that's kind of the, uh, the primary justification for that. Uh, when it comes to the origin of the Christian uh, belief and when it comes to uh, the appearances, we also have Paul's conversion. It kind of does double duty in both of those categories. Uh, Paul being one of the, well, he's arguably like the earliest, uh, most prolific Christian who wrote out uh, the theological beliefs of the, of the movement. He's definitely going to be the primary source for the origin of Christian belief. And you can also see how his belief changed and how that's relevant to uh, influences in um, contemporary Jewish thought. And likewise, he, of course, claimed that Jesus appeared to him. And then the last one, uh, the, the, the last fact is what I call the Messiah mutation. And this is the unique claim by Christian believers that the Messiah of Judaism was, in fact, supposed to be crucified and raised from the dead. This is something that is so bizarre that even if you are totally detached from the question of whether or not Jesus rose from the dead, just from a sort of history of religion's perspective or from a cultural perspective, accounting for this change in belief is one of the most challenging issues when you talk about like first century uh, Palestinian religious social, uh, sociocultural history. And so because of that, um, it's led, there are some people, N.T. Wright in particular, use this as an argument to say the best explanation of that uh, mutation in belief is in fact the historical occurrence of the resurrection. So that's just a survey of where, where we're going. Let me take a look at our time real quick. Okay, hey, we're doing really good on time, actually. Okay, so I'm, kinda, uh, I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly and then um, we'll stop for questions and discussion. And then uh, once I get through these, I have an extensive section of discussion where we'll talk about some alternative uh, hypotheses and theories and how to sort of think through this issue. So uh, first we have the issue of the women's testimony. So just stated, we have Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and a couple of other women. Uh, there's direct testimony of them having seen both the empty tomb um, of Jesus, like they went there and looked at it. Um, there is also the claim that they saw the risen Jesus as well, but that's actually not uh, as uncontroversial as, uh, as the claim of uh, them seeing the empty tomb. So why do most people, or why do people believe this? So the, the historical justification for thinking this uh, comes essentially in two lines. First, it is multiply and independently attested. So all four gospels have um, accounts of the women going to the tomb and finding it empty. Now, what's interesting is that the accounts, by all appearances, seem to be independent of each other. You can see this because of the fact that they don't really line up very well. Um, if you look in, I'm going from memory on this, but John, for example, has, uh, or sorry, the Gospel of John, has just Mary Magdalene going to the tomb, and then uh, it doesn't seem like there are any other characters or any other women that are accompanying her. Um, Whenever you have Matthew and Luke, they both have Mary Magdalene, and uh, I believe Mary, the mother of James, uh, goes, with, uh, goes with her. But whenever they arrive, the tomb, uh, they arrive at different times. There are different uh, um, 
I believe in Luke, the sun is already risen, whereas in Matthew, the sun is rising. Uh, the rock is rolled away in Matthew. It's, not ro- it's already been rolled away in uh, Luke. Um, there are different conversations that are had with the messengers that are present at the tomb, uh, things like that. They use different words for things. It, and by all indications, when we look at the Gospels where they overlap and we see, uh, for example, whenever we talked about last week about how, uh, you know, 30% of uh, Mark shows up in Luke, for example, we see the exact opposite of that happening here. And so the indication is that if in one case it seems like there has been literary borrowing from uh, Mark to Matthew, in this instance for you know, the, the women finding the empty tomb, it certainly seems like these are independent accounts. So if they're independent from each other and there are uh, at least four of them, that's a very good reason to think that this is in fact a historical uh, event, or at least there's a kernel of historicity there. Even if you think that the angels are embellishment, and if you think the angel coming out of heaven and rolling back the, the tomb in Matthew, if you think that's embellishment, the fact that you have four accounts that appear to be from different sources, but all sort of agree on the general idea, is a good reason uh, to think that it's historical. So that's the first line. The second reason to think that it's probably historical is that this particular feature, uh, in, in particular it being uh, women as first witnesses to the resurrection, is highly unlikely to have been fabricated. So there's a lot of talk about how sort of sexist the first century uh, was, and Judaism in particular was pretty sexist in a lot of ways. Um, But in general, women were not considered to be reliable witnesses. This shows up in legal uh, documents. It shows up in uh, some sort of um, additional commentary here and there. And so um, if you're making up a story and you want to have credibility, it makes a lot more sense to have a man as your primary witness, you know, a sober-minded, intelligent man who knows what's going on and he can be trusted, you know, uh, as opposed to a hysterical woman, right? That's not my thinking, of course, that's the, uh, the, the thinking at the time. And perhaps what's most provocatively is that we actually see evidence of the early church doing this. So when we look at the First Corinthian Creed, for example, when Paul says uh, that Jesus uh, died and was buried, and then he appeared to Mary Magdalene? No, he appeared to Peter. Even though if you read the narratives of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Peter is uh, technically third on the list after the women already find uh, uh, the risen Lord. And when you get to the Gospel of Peter, you know, there's sort of an extrapolation there. Um, the, The women are just completely out of the picture entirely by the time you get to that point. So some have argued that there's already this trajectory there where uh, the, uh, the later uh, the story goes on, the more the women are sort of sidelined. So the fact that they have such a central role in the gospel uh, accounts really seems to be like the authors of the gospel, despite their sexist uh, tendencies, didn't really have a choice other than to say, yeah, it was definitely the women. They were first, and the men kind of had to, were second to hear it. So that's why I like the little cartoon right there. So, okay. So um, that's why people think that uh, the women's testimony is most likely authentic. It's multiply attested, independently attested. And it's, uh, there are good reasons to think it's unlikely to be a fabrication. Okay, so that's the first one. So I've abbreviated this W. That'll be relevant later. Okay, the second one uh, is D, which is the disciple's testimony. And um, it, there are varying degrees of authenticity, varying degrees of historical debate. But in general, when we look at the list of the uh, uh, eyewitnesses, or sorry, the list of witnesses in the Corinthian Creed, we have a list there saying that Jesus appeared to the 11, or sorry, the 12. The 12 here refers, of course, to the 12 disciples. Um, But uh, despite that name, there were actually numerically only 11 uh, due to the fact that Judas met his demise um, uh, prior to the resurrection. And so these 11 are actually named explicitly uh, in the very first line of the book of Acts, or the first chapter of the book of Acts. And they're Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, uh, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. So we actually have these 11 guys, and we have a reasonably good account in Acts about what happened to them. There are additional witnesses, like I said, that are listed in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. So Peter and the uh, 12 disciples, you know, that kind of overlaps with the list from Acts. There's this weird line about Jesus appearing to 500 brethren all at one time. Uh, There's the specific list of James, the brother of Jesus, which is important because James was not considered a Christian until after um, the resurrection, or the purported resurrection at least. Uh, 
There's this line about all the apostles. Uh, so the question there is, there was a big group of Jesus followers. There was a core group of 12 disciples, and then there was a really core group of uh, just three disciples. Um, but the, all the apostles refers presumably to the larger group of Jesus' followers. And then, of course, there's the appearance to Saul of Tarsus. Um, so why I think that these are historical? And again, like the fact that the disciples claim to have seen the risen Lord is, of course, one of the most obvious things about Christianity that uh, very few people would ever uh, really dispute. But why think that they're actually telling the truth when they say, we have seen the risen Lord? Um, and the most classic example, which I've intentionally chosen, despite there are, there are a lot of other reasons, but the most classic example is, of course, that they were martyred, right? Uh, martyrs make poor liars is what's been said. And I love this argument for two reasons. Uh, first, because um, it's so hard to understand. Uh, there are several layers of clarification and precision that are necessary to accurately understand what an argument from martyrdom uh, means. So typically the claim is, we know Peter saw Jesus because he died uh, by, for claiming it. But that's not what the argument is. Because the retort is, of course, well, don't people die all the time for stuff that's made up? Uh, don't we have, um, you know, like suicide bombers that go and say... Uh, you know, they believe in crazy things and then go blow up buildings uh, in that belief. So obviously if people die, then that doesn't mean that they're telling the truth. So it sounds hedgy and it sounds kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? It sounds very um, waffling, that's the word. But to be precise, an argument for martyrdom works like this. If a person claims to believe a particular uh, proposition or statement, and they are in a position to know that it is true or know that it is false, and if they willingly uh, suffer hardship and even you know, bodily death and punishment for said belief, then it is highly unlikely that the original belief for which they died and or suffered is something that was intentionally fabricated with the design of deceiving people. Got all that? Yeah, exactly. It's, very, it's a very precise thing. So all this really boils down to is, if you're in a position to know something is true or false, and if you claim that something is true, and if you suffer for claiming that it's true, and you continue to suffer for claiming that it's true, it's unlikely that you made it up to deceive people. So at minimum, they were sincere in their belief. Even if they were deceived or mistaken or confused or whatever it was, at their very heart, they thought that they were believing the truth. Um, and so when it comes to the martyrdom uh, cases, you know, it's, if you read Fox's Book of Martyr, Martyrs, for example, you're going to get a really uh, hagiographic account of what happened to the early Christians. You get a full detailed analysis of the death of all uh, 11 uh, disciples, um, plus every single Christian that has ever died ever. That is a historical nightmare, of course. So when it comes to the disciples that were actually martyred uh, and are known to have been martyred, it, uh, Peter and Paul are like the quintessential ones. Everyone knows that they were martyred. There's no historical doubt about it. Um, Stephen was martyred in Acts chapter 5, um, and most people don't doubt that he was killed. The question there is, did he die having seen the risen Christ? That's where it gets kind of wonky. Uh, James, the brother of Jesus, was almost certainly martyred. Um, there are numerous accounts of how he got martyred, but the, like, uh, there are discussions about whether he was thrown off a temple, whether he was stoned, whether he was beat to death. There's some uh, uncertainty about the methodology, but he definitely was, he was definitely killed. And then uh, James, son of Zebedee, was also almost certainly uh, martyred. Now, you could add some, some more where there's like a little bit of doubt and fuzziness, but these are the ones that come up all the time, and no one really throws a fit if you say that they, uh, that they were martyred. So I guess that's what, four people, five people, something like that? Okay, so those are the disciples. Now, the last uh, quick little fact here is a little bit difficult to understand, but this is uh, the origin of Christian belief, which is to say that uh, Christianity was not its own sort of brand new uh, religion straight out of the box, but rather it was a mutation within first century Judaism. So the argument is pretty difficult uh, to track because there are um, an inordinate amount of like little facts and data points in order to to, to keep track of. Um, to give you an example, N.T. Wright, who, I, who I've quoted a couple of times before, in his book, The Resurrection of the Son of God, he essentially is all in on this argument. 
And the way he makes this argument is he surveys just about every piece of extant literature um, 100 years before Christ and every piece of extant literature 100 years after Christ related to life, death, the afterlife, and religious belief. And then tries to trace where the Christian belief in resurrection would have come from. Um, and quite simply, there really isn't uh, a very clean source for where that belief would have come from. There was certainly belief in Judaism about resurrection, but that belief in resurrection was tied to like a bunch of other beliefs um, that had nothing to do with Jesus, and most importantly, had nothing to do with the Jewish Messiah. So here are seven such beliefs that uh, Wright articulated as having been a mutation between Second, Second Temple Judaism, which was just, you know, short First Temple Judaism, and when the uh, earliest proclamation of Christian uh, believers. So for example, there was a huge debate, you can even read about it in the New Testament, between the uh, Sadducee party and the Pharisee party within Judaism. And the question was, does, uh, will God resurrect anybody at the end of time? The Sadducees said, no, uh, there is no resurrection. Whereas the Pharisees said, yes, there is a resurrection. In earliest Christianity, this is not a debate. Like, this is literally a homogenous belief in resurrection. In fact, the only controversy that appears to have shown up, in, at least in the pages of the New Testament, was not if resurrection happens, but when resurrection happens. Um, you'll remember uh, Paul mentions uh, two believers that had made shipwreck of their faith by claiming the resurrection has already happened. Um, so in this case, that's an interesting uh, change between those two, those two groups. Secondly, the belief in resurrection was sort of peripheral in Second Temple Judaism. Uh, in Christian conversations, and particularly in Christian sermons, uh, I, I've definitely heard there, uh, a, a lot of preachers do this. You try to like raid the Old Testament and find like a prophecy of Jesus or a prophecy of resurrection. A lot of talk about Ezekiel and the Valley of Dry Bones and all that stuff. Um, but in reality, historically, the resurrection and those debates were kind of on the peripheral edge of uh, debates in Judaism. There were a lot bigger issues, such as like, how are we Jews if there is no temple? Like, what's all that about? That was a, a much bigger debate. Whereas in earliest Christianity, what does Paul say in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15? If Christ is not raised, then your faith is in vain. Uh, he literally argues that um, if Jesus has not been raised, then the dead are not, or if the dead are not raised, then Jesus is not raised. Like, it's, it's like the central part of the faith. Uh, in Second Temple Judaism, there was a lot of back and forth discussion between the Pharisees on what exactly a resurrection body is, uh, whereas in earliest Christianity, there are very precise descriptions of what resurrection entails. Although, even in these precise discussions and descriptions, there is a lot of room for uh, variation and speculation. We may actually talk about that next semester. That was a suggestion uh, for a topic. Um, Fourthly, this is another major issue. The resurrection in um, Second Temple Judaism was this end of times resurrection, that at the end of the age, at the end of human history, God would resurrect everybody uh, up from the ground, um, either into uh, salvation or into condemnation. Whereas in earliest Christianity, the confession was that Jesus, in particular, as a unique event in history, was resurrected by himself independent of a large group. Now, Paul does go on to say that Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. However, the, even that distinction between a first fruit and a general resurrection was something not present in antecedent uh, Judaism. Um, I'll skip this uh, fifth point uh, just because that would take forever to try to explain. Um, the sixth point is also pretty minor, so I'll just get to the seventh point, which is this right here. In Second Temple Judaism, the view of the Messiah, again, there were a bunch of different ones, but a central uh, theme was that the Messiah was supposed to bring political liberation to the Jewish people and the people of God. Whereas, what is the claim of earliest Christianity? The Messiah humbled himself, made himself a servant to the political powers that be, and uh, suffered the most humiliating uh, death. And not only, like, the, 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 the uh, dramatic irony here is literally maximum. You have someone who is expected to come and overturn the governing authorities, whereas in reality, or in Christianity, the, the claim is uh, the Messiah subjected himself willingly to the authority, power, and even the execution of the governing authorities. So that is probably the most significant uh, mutation between, uh, between the two. Okay. And then, let's see here. 
Um, yeah, that's just a more elaborate point there on uh, the thing here. Okay, so that's that. And the next part will just be trying to discuss uh, all of these uh, particular um, historical facts. So let me pause and ask, are there any questions or comment or discussion before we start talking about alternative explanations, theories, and things of that nature? Let me see if I can back up to a reasonable. That seems reasonable. Oh, there's something in the chat. Uh, sorry. OK. Alex in the chat says, oh, wow, I missed that. That was like 10 minutes ago. How about the response that men would not visit the tomb afterward? It would only be women whose job it was to deal with dead bodies. So that's the only way to get a tomb visit to make sense, uh, given that they were the ones to put spices on the body. So if they were going to make up a story, that's a reason to make a woman discovery, since men uh, could later confirm. Um, so, <laughs> yes. So I've heard this one, uh, th and this is a uh, this is a very interesting uh, claim. So the claim is essentially, why make up women if you're going to have uh, a fabricated story? And the response is, well, women would be the ones that go and check the tomb. The issue here is that this is first, it's speculation on speculation, and also it presupposes that the burial of the tomb, or the burial in the tomb is historical. So the only way that you can even get to this point is if you've already conceded that that's a historical fact. Otherwise, you would just have to say, um, why is it that they would, uh, in, in other words, why would they invent women to explain a fact that they already invented? Uh, it seems like um, the, the literary psychology here is sort of inconsistent on that point. So I, I, I don't particularly understand the rationale. I actually accept the empty tomb to be the case, to accept the woman being the, the, woman being the ones going to the tomb, specifically because uh, it could be that as the story or the legend was growing and the empty tomb became a part of that story, then the logical answer for the people that would find the empty tomb would end up being the woman. And mm -hmm. so as the legend again was growing and building, and the empty tomb became a part of it, mm -hmm. just naturally, as a part of that empty tomb legend becoming, you know, being incorporated, would be the woman visiting the tomb, because it's just a logical sign. It's just, who would logically be going to the tomb? I, I think the fact that the later accounts actually, as you said, the later accounts uh, omit the women shows that that the that that's not something that bothers people, right? Right, because so the in the creedal statements they don't mention the women, and in the later accounts, you know, in later decades, like I think we noted the Gospel of Peter, right? Mm -hmm. The women are omitted, so it seems like they did not view having a man discover Jesus at the tomb or the empty tomb as being un implausible. Because the other accounts do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it seems it, you, you, to get into the mind of the objection, you have to say that the authors of the gospel first invented the story of uh, the burial at the tomb, and they invented the character of Joseph of Arimathea, and they invented the characters of the women discovering the, the tomb. Whenever it seems to me the easiest thing to do, well, again, inventing, a char uh, in, inventing the story such that their primary witnesses have to later be expunged from later accounts. Where it seems to me like, if you're going to invent three layers of your story, the easiest way, especially if you're trying to pull something over somebody, is to have, say, Joseph of Arimathea go discover it. It's his tomb. That seems way more plausible. But that was kind of, a, part of what that had in it, it was assuming that this was an intent to deceive. Mm -hmm. When, for me, it would be more of just, part of the legend as people are just spreading it over the course of just day-to-day -day evangelism, talking to neighbors, talking to the people who are running the shops that they're trying to convert. Just mm -hmm. over time, the idea of an empty tomb appearing or ha uh, an empty tomb you know, existing and the woman being the people that went and saw it first would end up be just becoming part of the story. And then pe later on with the other people that talk about the resurrection, they might just simply not like that part of the story for other reasons and just be like, that's actually not accurate, or make claims about it, because again, 
It would just be well, a story that's spreading. I, well, I guess the question is, is how, I mean, how is the story building and then how is it being written down? That, that, would, so, be, that would be the question because remember, the only reason that the women are under, uh, assuming this, this growth of the legend, the only reason that the women are invented, uh, or this, the, the story of them going to the tomb is invented, is because the tomb itself has already been invented, Joseph of Arimathea has already been invented, um, and the uh, burial, him burying the, him in the tomb has already been invented. So, so here, here, so the, here, the, the, there's actually a really good example of a uh, uh, sort of a counter expectation. If you're expecting Jesus to be crucified and then no one knows what happens to his body after that, well, you would in fact expect to see our varying uh, traditions about what happened to his body. Case in point, like there's literally evidence in the Bible. What, like for example, what happened to Judas Iscariot? Did he hang himself? Did he fall into a field? It's not super clear. People know that he died, but then you have two competing accounts about what actually transpired for him to die. If it's true that Jesus was you know, hypothetically thrown into like a, a common grave or something, um, or something to that effect. If it's unknown what happens to his body, you, it would be predicted to have varying traditions about what actually happened to him. So you might have some people saying that he was uh, buried in a tomb by Joseph of Arimathea. You may have some other people saying that he was like assumed into heaven or something like that. You may have uh, another narrative uh, completely unrelated that says that Jesus you know, didn't die or something like. You would expect there to be uh, sort of a branching effect to happen at the point of uncertainty. But the fact that you have not only that uh, you have one single narrative, you actually have three independent elements of that narrative that are all uniform across multiple sources. Even in the late sources, like the Gospel of Peter, you, the, uh, which completely gets rid of uh, the women, doesn't get rid of the tomb. Like that fact still pervades all the way through. So if you say that the, the burial account of Joseph of Arimathea and the discovery of the empty tomb uh, by the women, if that was a part of a legendary accretion, it would have had to happen extremely early to then percolate all the way out. It's a lot like a mutation. Um, whenever you have like a population that shares, uh, you have a very divergent population that they all share sort of you know, a, a line of their uh, same genetics, it's because they have a really early common ancestor. Yeah, it would, it would, it would, the resurrection which would, would involve the story of the empty tomb would end up being one of the core things that originated early on. Yeah, in fact, so... That sense as one of the core things originating early on. Yeah, but so early, like literally so early, that you're bumping right up against the testimony of the witnesses themselves. Yeah. So, so that, that's where it's starting to cut against and the uh, legendary this, accretion. Yeah. This might be a little bit later on, but I'm not 100% certain what, like, how much evidence you actually have for the witnesses. Like, the, a lot of the witnesses that are claimed to exist. Because... Well, are we even just talking about the textual witnesses? Well, just merely the composition. Like the, the human well, witnesses? Specifically, like, talking about, like, in the Gospels and uh, in the, uh, in Paul's letters and in mm -hmm. the, like, even in the Cre Corinthian Creed. Yeah. There aren't very many people, or actually, I don't think there's, I may be mistaken on this, but I, from what I understood, the only person that actually is, like, making an active claim that I witnessed this, and I am actually like, basically the only person who's actively making that claim that I witnessed this is Paul himself. Mm -hmm. And the rest of it is like, the apostles are claiming to be witnesses or mm -hmm. something along the lines of, the apostles are witnesses mm -hmm. or they saw the risen Jesus. Yeah, well in the, in, if you recall from the, the sources like the speeches in Acts for example, you literally have the people you know, you have the apostle standing up saying, I have seen the risen Lord. And then the author of Acts writes that down. Or somebody that he's familiar with writes that down. And then that's where, that's where your source is going to. And uh, you could have, it depends on how uh, close you want to slice it. If you want to be really generous, you could say that you have a list of 11 people in Acts. And then there's your, you have 11 witnesses. If you want to be really precise and just say, who are the actual uh, recorded speeches in Acts that we do have? And I think it would probably be like five or six. I, I don't know. I would have to go off the top of my head. But then you would have to say that the Gospel of Acts is not historic, or the Gospel of Acts. You have to say that the speeches in Acts are not going back to their um, the, source, or they would have to go well, to some other location. The speeches in Acts would represent what the early Christians believed 
who have occurred. Right, and, not, but in this case, the early Christians are Peter and uh, oh, Stephen and James, um, and the list of witness. Like, think about it like this: the list of witnesses that Paul has in First Corinthians, their speeches are then recorded in the Book of Acts. So if, if you say that the speeches in Acts, which are widely considered to be independent of what the author of, of, of Acts was saying, uh, if you say that those actually go back to their source, then you do have like dual confirmation. Here's a list of witnesses and here's what they had to say. Right, so why do we, I guess, why, are we believe, why would we say that we believe that the person who was like writing Acts specifically like was at the speech, like at the speeches as they were being there mm -hmm. and writing them down and being a specific scribe of these speeches and not getting it from, for instance, just the Christian community as a whole that's like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, I, I heard that this is what the apostle has said, this mm -hmm. is the speech that he gave. Yeah, and so. That be a general Christian idea and a Christian belief. There, the yeah, the, the debate over speeches and particularly just in ancient history is, is a pretty thorny topic. So the, the first line is really just kind of to make the argument that in general, like, like in general, uh, Roman historians, Greek historians, uh, when they were reporting a speech, the one thing that they didn't lie about for the most part, like they didn't just fabricate speeches, um, was out of thin air. Like if there was a speech that occurred at a certain time, they would record a speech happening at a certain time. Um, now there is a certain degree, there is a debate about the amount of liberty that was taken with the actual words. In fact, there's a, a couple of case studies where, um, oh, I forgot his name, uh, Plutarch, there it is. There are a couple of case studies where Plutarch uh, records a certain speech, and then an independent witness of that speech uh, is uh, is available, and you can actually compare how much they agree. And you find that they don't line up word for word. They line up in the gist of it, but they don't line up in, uh, word for word. So the uh, first, but however, the difference is that that speech wasn't completely manufactured uh, from the ground up. So that's the first line: is that you don't, in general, you know, sort of a generic argument. Uh, uh, speeches aren't fabricated. The second line would have to get to be more specific into historical criticism of the Book of Acts. Um, and two lines of evidence there are, are particularly relevant. So for example, one that I can't really talk about in great detail is just that, because uh, I don't know too much about it, is that the speeches themselves have shifts in tone. So for example, you have the Book of Acts, you have the Book of Luke, both of these are written by the same author, you can read, um, you have a really large data set of what this author is actually writing. Then when you hit the, uh, the speeches, you notice there's a distinct shift where it sounds like he's either translating something or um, the source is not from his own hand, but it's rather from something else. A lot of people have even speculated that uh, the speeches and acts may have even been directly translated from Aramaic in, into Greek, uh, and that explains it. So that would be the third sort of textual line. And then the third one gets to be really, really detailed which is who is the author of the Book of Acts. Um, and there I'd recommend a guy named Craig Keener, who's probably like the, the foremost uh, guy who's looked into that question. And the core argument comes down to this. When you read the second half of the Book of Acts, you get uh, a lot of these we statements, like we went to this city, we did this, we did that. Um, and so there are, I, I wouldn't say a majority of historians, maybe a majority, maybe a slim majority, but a good size of historians certainly think that the author of Acts, whoever he was, call him Luke, call him whatever, was an actual traveling companion with Paul. So then when you get to this question of what uh, warrant do we have for thinking that the author of Acts accurately communicates the witnesses of, uh, or the testimony of the witnesses, that's sort of where you go. You say, well, it sounds like he wasn't making up these speeches, sounds like they're coming from somebody else, and he was a traveling companion of the man who gave us the list of witnesses in the first place, which is a really strong argument for thinking that uh, the gist of them is accurate. I, th I think there's another really important thing, too, when you're talking about a book. You really need to you know, read the book and, and try to distinguish different types of writing, right? Yeah. So if you read, for example, Mark, and then go read Luke Acts, Mark, is basically just this kind of rambling collection of stories with, you know, kind of random levels of detail in different places. Whereas Luke and Acts are very different. Um, Luke is like a legitimate uh, first century historical account where he describes the method that he used to gather the data 
Um, and then he goes into this incredibly precise detail in uh, the, uh, the events that he's recounting. He's not just recounting kind of vague events. He's recounting specific like routes of travel. And it, it's, it, it, it's really hard if you read Luke Acts to say that this is a later historical accretion of legend that has been recorded. Um, it, it, that's just not at all the genre of it. It is very precise his, history, um, you know, on the level of like the annals or you know other historical accounts from that era. Julie had so, Seth, when you say, would you say, and I ha I haven't read of all of N.T. Wright's argument in his mm -hmm. big book. I have it, but I haven't. On um, wouldn't the Messiah mutation argument? be key to arguing against this invention legend type of thing? Because they wouldn't have invented resurrection. Um, they wouldn't have invented empty tomb. Well, yeah, it, it, uh, that particular line of argument starts to get enormously difficult because you have to make a theological argument about what resurrection is yeah. fundamentally, uh, which the previous time we talked about this topic was uh, actually kind of my, my main focus, and I kind of I cut it here to talk more about historiographical things. But in, um, in that particular case, I actually heard a really good example that summarizes N.T. Wright's argument like from a high level, which is, I'll adapt it for our current uh, setting here in, in Texas A&M. Imagine that you leave College Station. I'm just gonna sit with that one for a minute. Okay, imagine you leave this town <laughs> and, uh, and you, you know go out for 10 years, get a job or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then you come back and it turns out that um, the statue of the twelfth man on, you know, in Kyle Field, has been replaced by um, what appears to be like uh, a humanoid alien. It's not human at all. It's completely alien. Kyle Field has been renamed something like Zorgon Field. Um, it turns out that uh, you see these memorial plaques at Texas A&M about an alien visitation that uh, came here to College Station. Um, it turns out every reference to Aggie, Aggie Land, Twelfth uh, Man, all of that has been completely replaced by references to some type of Area 51 type event where an alien has come down to flying saucer or something like that. Now, the argument here is you have to provide an explanation of why on earth that happened. Even if you don't believe in aliens, uh, you know, if you, don't, if you think that the entire thing is made up, it doesn't really matter what you think about aliens. You have to actually provide an explanation as to why this town, which was so saturated with you know, agricultural iconography, suddenly switched to being completely centered around alien visitations for some reason. And so Wright's argument is that. He says, when you actually understand Judaism and Second Temple Judaism on Second Temple Judaism's terms, then you start to see in very sharp relief how different the Christian claims are. Um, and he talks about how even though in, uh, within Judaism, there's not, it's not, obviously there's not like one homogenous, this is the Judaism that exists. But he says that even in the various branches that we know about, so Sadducees, Pharisees, Essenes, et cetera, uh, Maccabeans, et cetera, et cetera, you can see certain trends, certain shared assumptions that are then completely reversed uh, and swapped around whenever it comes to uh, Christian belief. So some people have said that like Christians are closer to the Essenes, but even with the Essenes, you see a lot of similarity in like the Messiahs, this eschatological agent and things like that. But there's almost no connection to the Messiah will come, suffer, and then die, and then resurrect by himself. Like that just isn't, it, it just isn't in any antecedent uh, uh, conditions. But why isn't that a good argument against them making it up it, um, for, the, for the person who thinks well, that everything was invented, it w uh, they wouldn't have invented it. So, so to, to be clear, to be clear, there's a difference between saying inventing something out of thin air and inventing something or interpreting an event that did happen. And that's actually what most people argue. In fact, in this big book at the very end, I was actually just looking at it here, there's like yeah, about 200 pages where Lacona surveys a bunch of different uh, views. And the argument is not the 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 the... the Strong arguments against the resurrection are not, this group of people were bored, was bored and just decided to make something up one day. Their argument is they had a very strong and very bizarre experience with uh, this particular rabbi, Jesus of Nazareth, that then led them to start talking about things in terms of resurrection. 
Maybe it was some type of weird hallucination. Maybe it was some type of like drug even. If you want to get to like really weird stuff, you know, drugs are involved. But whatever it is, it caused them to start talking in these terms. Um, I don't know if that answered your question <laughs> or was relevant. Well, I'm, I'm saying even if you, even for interpretation, you're, according to N.T. Wright, maybe in their background of what they knew, that's not something they would interpret like that. It, it's highly unlikely, yeah. Yeah, I, I see what you mean. Yeah, Wright says there are many alternative spiritual theological interpretations that make more sense than jumping to resurrection. So, for example, he talks about um, there's, uh, uh, you know, Judaism was kind of a visionary culture, um, and, and there were definitely in the Old Testament a lot of visions and whatnot that, uh, that occur, and even the disciples themselves later have visions, uh, even in the New Testament. And so he talks about how there is an entire category of spiritual visions, like in Judaism. And he says it's so strange that they would jump way over this huge, like there's like this huge theological um, reservoir of interpretation that they just completely evil Knievel style jump over straight to this wild view of resurrection. And again, the claim of resurrection being wild doesn't sound wild 2,000 years post uh, Christianity, post uh, you know, in a in a culture that has literally been defined by Christianity. Okay, so, right, all right, so then the question here is, and this, this will kind of tie a bow on, on everything pretty quickly, which is, um, when you assemble all these historical facts related to Jesus, you have to have some type of an uh, explanation for, for what happened to him. Even if you reject the resurrection, you still have to account for something. So, the question then is, what makes for a good historical explanation? Um, and there's a list of criteria that are provided by a dude named, um, what's his name, C.B. McCullough, that's it, that have been sort of canonized informally as this is what makes for a good explanation um, when you're trying to figure out what happened in the past historically. The first one is what's called explanatory power, which says how well does this particular theory or explanation explain the data that need to be accounted for? So how well uh, does it actually explain things? The second one is explanatory scope, which is how many of the data are explained by this particular hypothesis. Does it leave any loose ends hanging out there? The third one is plausibility, which is given everything that we know about the world, how things operate, and our prior information about the subject matter, does this theory make sense, or is it just completely uh, implausible? And the last one is what's called degree of ad hocness, which just simply means is the theory being arbitrarily contrived to sort of fit what data is available rather than being predictive of what data is available? Um, so I'm trying to think of a good example of, uh, ah, is anyone familiar with the term epicycles? Anyone heard that term before? Dr. Robbins is familiar with the term epicycles. So epicycles is a classic uh, use for this. So uh, brief aside, um, you, everyone should read The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas Kuhn excellent book in philosophy of science. Um, but prior to Copernicus's uh, heliocentric view of the universe, you had a couple of different um, star charts that were sort of put together. In particular, the Ptolemaic system presupposed that the Earth was the center of the universe and that all the stars and everything around us revolved around the planet Earth. So the question then is, how do you account for things like retrograde of planets? So if you ever look up in the night sky and observe, say, Jupiter over a long period of time, you'll see that Jupiter comes this way some, and then it goes back this way uh, as uh, the year goes on. So on the Copernicus system, it makes sense. The sun is the center of the solar system. You have Earth and you have Jupiter, and at some points we're moving faster than Jupiter, and at some points Jupiter is moving faster than us, so you can get that retrograde motion in virtue of just the fact that we're both orbiting the same object. But if you posit that the Earth is the center, then you have to use these fancy things called epicycles, which you have to go back, and this isn't a star chart class, so I'm not gonna go in all detail, but essentially you have to go and say, draw extra circles and draw extra concentric rings that go around your planets in order just to explain something as simple as, why does star go like this? So epicycle has become a catch-all for is something ad hoc. 
And it turns out in order to make the Ptolemaic system work, you had to have epicycle on top of epicycle on top of epicycle on top of epicycle on top of epicycle. It's enormously complicated. So when Copernicus came around and said, actually, we don't need any epicycles. We just need this one change, put the Earth uh, or put the sun at the center. All the epicycles were done with. So when you find yourself having to put metaphorical epicycles into your theory to get things to work, it's probably being ad hoc. It's a long-winded explanation. I really should rein in my tangents. OK. Woo, forgot about that. Let's go back. <laughs> Does this make sense here? Okay, so let me walk through an example here. So basically, if you have uh, a couple of facts about Jesus and a couple of facts about his fate. So if you account for the fact like, let's say Jesus died by crucifixion, he was uh, buried in a tomb, uh, some folks claimed to see him after he died, and in particular, Paul, who was a persecutor of his followers, uh, changed his mind due to a vision of Christ. Let's just say those four facts are what we're focused in on. You could obviously add more. So what would be an explanation? So let's just use the resurrection hypothesis, hypothesis as an example. Suppose Jesus actually did raise from the dead uh, and did actually appear to all the people that he claimed to appear to, and uh, including Paul. Well, clearly, that explains things pretty well. Why did the disciples believe in the resurrection? Because they saw the resurrected Christ. Why was the tomb empty? Because Jesus left the tomb. Uh, why did Paul convert? Because he actually saw the risen Lord. Um, it makes a lot of sense. Explanatory scope, does that make sense? Well, yeah, every single piece of data uh, um, is explained by such a hypothesis. Um, now, the question is, is it plausible? And this is where we're going to loop all the way back to the very first comment that I said, which is, what is necessary for the resurrection hypothesis to be plausible? It's a miracle claim, so you have to have miracles in your worldview. Now, if you don't think miracles happen, or if you don't think that God exists, it's not going to be plausible. There's no way to slice it because you're a priori saying miracles don't happen, therefore all miracle claims are implausible. That's why I said at the very beginning, if we assume that the arguments that we've already surveyed are at least moderately successful, then we actually do have a prior probability of God existing prior to uh, confirming or prior to looking at this uh, particular evidence related to Jesus. So this is where probably the biggest debate is. Um, and that's why, I'm that's why I would argue that the more, or, you know, uh, the more credence you put into those arguments or the more credence you put into the statement God exists, the more plausible a particular miracle claim is going to be. And then the last one is, of course, ad hoc. Is the theory being arbitrarily contrived to fit the data? And I don't think it is. It seems pretty straightforward. Uh, you have one postulate. God raised Jesus from the dead. Well, actually, you don't even need to posit that. You just need to say Jesus rose from the dead. And that's the only postulate you have that explains a wide range of data. You don't have to add on other things on top of that. So I would say that if you were to look at these criteria and then evaluate them based, or if you were to evaluate the resurrection hypothesis on that view, the plausibility would probably be the hardest sell on that because um, not everyone's going to accept uh, a miracle claim. I can say personally that if someone came up to me claiming a different miracle besides the resurrection, I would be very skeptical. But if you look at other hypotheses um, that are alternative to the resurrection, um, you would have to evaluate them more or less on the same uh, scale. So let me just give a random one. No one, no one actually believes this anymore, so let me just give an example. Some people think that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross. Uh, this is called the swoon theory, that Jesus was on the cross for a little bit. He was put into a tomb. Uh, there was like a Mario mushroom in there or something. I don't really know how this works, but somehow uh, he survived. Um, he pushed the rock back, beat up the Roman guards, uh, and then apparently ran all the way to Galilee uh, to see his disciples, and he says, ha-ha, I'm here. This was like one of those goofy views in the 1800s. No one actually believes this anymore. But suppose Jesus didn't actually die. Does that actually explain anything? No, it explains almost nothing. Like, it doesn't make sense of anything in the data. It also doesn't explain, for example, if this Jesus was the one that appeared to Paul, why didn't Paul just kill him on the spot, right? Like, this half-beaten guy, you know, uh, doesn't make any sense at all. Um, explanatory scope, of course, it completely says that Jesus didn't die, so it denies the very first fact, which is that Jesus died, so it fails on that. Is it plausible? Almost certainly not. Everything in that story is questionable from beginning to end. Is it ad hoc? Of course, you would, in order to make it work, you would have to add in a whole bunch of other stuff about why didn't this happen, why didn't that happen, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just an example. It's goofy, no one believes it, not a serious hypothesis, but that's just an example of how the, those criteria work. Any questions about that or any comments? <laughs>
I want to be mindful of time here. So in general, now, let me make a radical claim. In general, the way the resurrection argument would work is to say that if you take any alternative explanation to the resurrection, it's going to uh, fail on these criteria, whereas the resurrection hypothesis will succeed on these criteria. Now, in order to show this, you would actually have to spend several years reading every hypothesis that's ever come up, and you would have to critically evaluate it on all four of these criteria, and you would have to stack it up against the resurrection hypothesis to do that. So if we get started right now, we might finish next year, okay? Are y'all ready? All right, let's go. We're gonna view from every hypo, no, no, Ada says no, okay. So I'm not actually gonna go through all of these uh, details. So here are literally just three that I thought of um, that uh, we can kind of uh, discuss uh, briefly. I already mentioned that swoon hypothesis. The other one, the hallucination view, <laughs> Sam's on board. I, I don't know why y'all aren't. Um, the hallucination view is another one that's not particularly popular. Um, and it really comes down to the fact that uh, you have these appearances that appear to be veridical experiences and they appear to happen in groups. So it's not a hallucination. Now probably the, how would I put this? Probably the strongest alternative that I think takes a lot of brain power thinking through is what's called a bereavement uh, vision, which is to say that the disciples were really sad. They were um, extremely upset that they had just lost their mentor. They were already in a visionary uh, culture of Judaism. Um, and in that context, they had what was called a bereavement vision. Um, in fact, this book I have here called Resurrecting Jesus by Dale Allison gives a couple of case studies here where people have experiences of a loved one that has recently died, uh, and it sounds very close to what happened in, or uh, uh, very similar to the descriptions in the gospel. So for example, they kind of appear to walk through walls, they're present uh, physically in a certain sense, like they have like a warm touch uh, to, their, uh, um, to their skin, they uh, talk, to uh, the person who's experiencing this uh, bereavement. Um, and sometimes they even happen in groups, which is a little suspicious. So that would be- yeah, so Exactly, yeah, exactly. So the, the bereavement one is probably the strongest counterexample that would say, this is what the disciples experienced. Um, but it doesn't, and, uh, it doesn't really do much to explain why on earth Paul would have had this experience, so you have to have a separate hypothesis for Paul that's unrelated uh, to that. Um, and it also doesn't really account for the change in theology for the, uh, for the early Christians, because again, th uh, these types of experiences had happened before and are documented in the Bible, and they're not interpreted as resurrection. So that's where I think it's probably a little difficult. So if you were to do like a tier list of resurrection alternatives, swoon and hallucination would be like F tier, Bereavement vision would be like B tier, maybe A tier. Like pretty good, but not probably not as good. Okay. Um, I did want to mention just one uh, loose thing, which is uh, the Messiah mutation. The harder you hit this point of saying that the early disciples did not anticipate a Messiah that was crucified and resurrected, the harder you hit that point, the harder it is to say, didn't Jesus spend his whole ministry saying, I'm the Messiah and I'm going to be crucified? How do you interpret these predictive prophecies of Jesus um, if you think that they weren't being expected? So I think that's probably the, the hardest point there. But, okay, yeah, further reading. So that's the, the list of all the, the sources that I recommend. So the question here, so let's take a step back real quick and just kind of look at the whole, the whole thing uh, very quickly. So we started at the beginning of this semester asking, is there good reason to believe Christianity is true? Um, and of course, we've done a lightning round tour through uh, sort of the foundation of natural theology. We talked about the cosmological argument, the design argument, and the moral argument. We talked about argument uh, from evil, the free will defense, the odyssey, things like that. And then we spent a lot of time talking about Jesus and why uh, there's pretty good reason to think that uh, Jesus was raised from the dead. Now, like I said, this is, could take years and years on any one of those topics to plumb the, the depths of it. But I think that we've provided at least a reasonable foundation uh, to sort of answer that question as to why I think that um, there's good reason to, to think that Christianity is true. 